Tape recorder's running, right? All your electricals look okay over there, bud? Man, I'm not going to look at them. All right. It's the 50th anniversary of the moon landing, and I hope you're excited as we are. I can't hear you. I can't hear you. All kidding aside, I really can't. Hey, that was really fun, but let's never do that again. You may or may not have heard this elsewhere, but either way, you've heard it here first. In commemoration of the 50 year anniversary of the moon landing, Adam Savage and the Smithsonian are building a replica of the Apollo 11 command module hatch. Quick backstory, recently got an email informing me that Adam Savage and the Smithsonian wanted my help to make parts. Of course, I replied immediately, telling them that I wasn't born yesterday and can see right through their phishing scam. Try to get one over on me. Turns out it was legit. Shout out to John Saunders at NYCCNC for putting my name in their hat. They sent this and asked if I could turn it around in two weeks. I told them I couldn't and to send me something easier. They replied with this. <coughs> Those Aaron Spacers are a cheeky bunch. So, of course, I asked them for something a little more complicated, and they sent this. Not bad, though I looked it over and told them two weeks could get them an even more complicated part still. At that point, they told me they didn't have all day to be emailing back and forth with me and to just make both parts. So here we are. That's the story of how my humble and mildly embarrassing contribution came to be. PSA. Parts are being collected at the National Air and Space Museum and will be assembled in the next week or so. If you'd like to go watch the build live, I'll put the date up on the screen. I don't know if you'll have to pay to get in, but don't worry. In commemoration, all proceeds from the event will be fired off into the vacuum of deep space. Okay, I'm not 100% sure that last part is actually true, but I can tell you what is. I've already made the parts. In fact, they're already there. And since I was a bit under the gun to make them, this video will be a mishmash of after-the-fact narration, machining, and some thoughts while I did have the parts in hand. Let's get started. Luckily, I do have a bit more dehydrated space aluminum. Ow, I always forget how cold this stuff gets after undergoing such rapid expansion. I'll spare you the drudgery of watching me karate chop this up into pieces, and we'll get started with the easy bracket. Let's stop a moment and talk about this wonderful sound. This is what end mill rubbing looks like. See those thin wispy chips? If you can even call them chips. That's not enough tool pressure. The mill has the horsepower and the rigidity for this cut, but I can't keep up with the hand wheels. I can't move the end mill fast enough or consistently enough, and I'm getting that wonderful music. It didn't take me long to reduce the depth of cut enough so I could keep up with the manual feed, and now the chips look a lot nicer.
the flanges on this part are radiused. The right way to do this is to use a rotary table, but I'm setting up for Dale, Dale Derry's Daringly Dangerous Diameter Drick. Be careful if you try this. Despite what it might look like, the vise is clamped for every single cut. The base of this flange also gets rounded corners, and the CNC router was an easy way out. And there's the mounting bracket. I also made the pin. Not exactly sure how this pin is retained. Must lock into the mating part, but there it is. Not a complicated part by any stretch, but I'm happy with how it turned out. Only thing that's bothering me is the finish. It doesn't look quite right. It looks more like a Mars part than a moon part. At the risk of ruining this thing, I think I'm gonna try to sandblast it and see how that looks better. I used moon dust and set the solar wind pressure to about 100 PSI. Not quite there yet, but better. Though now, unfortunately, it looks like one of those cheap brackets that come with DRO kits. This is a 400 grit stone. Let's see if it can help this little bracket develop some space character. If I don't like it, I can always sandblast it again. I'm just gonna hit all the edges. I'm sure there's high spots. Although now you can see some of the tool marks again, I think it's much better than before. Personal preference, but I don't like that sterile look. To me, this now looks like it belongs as far from Earth as possible. <clears throat> with the easy bracket finished, it's time to move on to the bell crank, starting with the base. Here you may notice it's halfway done and sitting in my CNC router. I did want to manual machine all of these parts, but given the time, I thought I'd use one of my lifelines. Since this router only has half the horsepower of a real machining center, I've learned that it pays to rough out as much as I can manually and let the computer do the trickier work and final sizing. Let's jump back in time and see how I got to this shape. Now we can feed it to the router. Here's where things started to get a bit hairy. This part is tallish for my machine capacity and minimum spindle RPM. To get to all the features, I've had to resort to a relatively long and thin end mill. But the router is doing a pretty good job, but the chatter is absolutely brutal. This homemade router, with this end mill anyway, doesn't have the rigidity to keep the cutter from trying to dig itself into the wood. Now, I don't think you can see it in this clip here, but in the back of my mind, I was wondering if I just scrapped my part, or if my sandblasting finish might be able to hide those chopped lumps. And that's the top projection finished, if you can call that finished. We're set up in the manual mill again. This part has an occluded area that helps create the pivot point, the hinge area. In order to machine that, I have to rotate the part back 90 degrees. To make absolutely sure the part is square, I'm using a dial indicator. If that measurement doesn't change as I sweep the surface, I'm golden. Now I can start roughing out the pocket. Not rocket surgery. In fact, the only reason I'm still talking is because my mic died and I have no machine sound. And there it is, bell crank base completed. All that's left to do is separate it from the stock I carved it out of. You could flip this and go to all the trouble of milling and facing the bottom to spec, but I find a nice sharp cold chisel works best.
seen, we're looking at it. Nice straight stamping, just the way I like it. And thankfully, I just milled that island large enough to fit my punches. That was close. Here are all the parts. Finally finished. It's been a marathon. I've got to ship these ASAP, but let's make some family time to talk about a couple of the parts I don't think you've seen. Now, this is, don't remember what it's called exactly, the moon bracket, I hope, and I believe is pretty self-explanatory. These other parts make up one sub-assembly, basically a bell crank mechanism. The base carries the actual crank, which pivots around this copper pin. And copper and aluminum probably shouldn't be your first choice for a hinge, but, and I may have said this already, I didn't really get any material or build specs. This was open to my artistic interpretation. I used copper mostly for the color break, so it looks prettier. That, and I had a small piece close to the size I needed. A bell crank is used to change the direction of a force or an actuation, usually by 90 degrees, but it could be anything from zero to less than 360. So with the base firmly mounted, a tie rod or something that pulls on one hole in one direction, let's say off to the left in this frame, would pull a link or another tie rod in this location, in this hole, pulling in another direction. This pulls to the left, this one pulls down, changing the direction of force. There is another hole here. I'm not exactly sure what that's for. These are approximately one to one, meaning their distance from the pivot point is about the same. This one is different. So I assume in this mechanism, something else needs slightly different timing during that same motion. Its name, bell crank, comes from having to change the direction of the rope pull to ring bells, since bells turned out not to work so great when lying on their sides. Not to be confused with the popular Philadelphia branded methamphetamine. Whatever ends up attaching to this bell crank does so through a way over complicated bolt and bushing. NASA, am I right? That is a pretty snug fit. Everything is machined to nominal dimensions. Again, I didn't really get drawings that specified the fits, if this should be free running or press fit, if there's some other journal that rides on this, or if this is actually the journal. At any rate, easy enough for them to run a reamer or drill bit through if they want to loosen that up, which is probably better than it being too loose and them having to remake the part. I made the bushing from plastic for no other reason than the fact that it's green. When this is all assembled and sent to the moon, I want to be able to see my parts from my house. If they don't like green, they can paint it or 3D print another one perhaps. It's a simple enough part. The bolt is brass, not much to write home about other than the crazy head it's got. Hex inside and out. Although I could have cut this external hex on my mill, I was already setting up for the internal hex on the router, so I just ran both. Tangentially related, I may have a lead on a rotary brooch set. If I get it, I'll be sure to share, of course. A rotary brooch would allow me to cut the internal hex on my lathe, and in a tenth of the time probably, if not faster.
And that's that. Thanks to Tested and the Smithsonian for asking me to be a part of making some parts. And as always, bang zoom to the moon with you.